In the past two years, the Manga Bay Explorers podcast has featured conversations with conservation biologist Wulan Pusbarini and longtime Manga Bay reporter Jeremy Hans about the incredibly rare, critically endangered Sumatran rhino. Comparatively small and sporting a coat of wispy black fur and often communicating in song, they captivate the hearts and minds of conservationists and people all over the world. Their numbers have been dwindling for decades due to a variety of factors such as poaching and forest loss. All told, experts estimate that no more than 80 individuals remain in the wild. Historical captive breeding efforts have failed massively, leaving conservationists working against the clock to pull the species back from the brink of extinction. Well, the future of the species just got a little brighter this year with the birth of a new female Sumatran rhino calf. I'm Mike DiGirolamo, your host for Manga Bay Explorers, an episodic podcast series from MangaBay.com's global team, where I speak with experts, scientists, and activists from the field working to protect our natural world. You're listening to a special bonus episode building upon our continued coverage of the Sumatran rhino and efforts to conserve and rehabilitate its population. Joining me for this conversation is Manga Bay's senior staff writer in Indonesia, Bastan Gokan who reported on the 28th of March about the birth of a female Sumatran rhino calf, an effort with decades of trial and error behind it. Bastin outlines the rarity of this event, the significance it holds for the conservation community, and the prospects for the Sumatran rhino species. Uh, my name is Bastin Gokon. I'm in Indonesia. I am among the best uh, senior staff writer for Indonesia. Breeding Sumatran rhinos is no simple task. In the 1980s, roughly 40 Sumatran rhinos were captured as part of a large-scale breeding effort. Half of them died, and a calf wasn't even produced until 2001. And since this time, the wild Sumatran rhino population has only continued to dwindle. Um, it's very difficult, one, because you know there aren't uh, many Sumatran rhinos left. I think uh, officially the number is fewer than 80 individuals left in around the world and they live you know scattered between Sumatra and uh, Borneo right and I think Indonesia is the last home for Sumatran rhinos the last Sumatran rhino in Malaysia died a couple of years ago so that's that's one thing you know a small number of population and then living very much uh, far away from each other and then we have you know a few rhinos in captivity the Sumatran rhino species itself is they're very shy. You know, they, they don't necessarily like to be surrounded by many people, let alone human, or I'm just talking about like a lot of individuals, like even with the rhinos themselves, you know. On top of this, females can experience health complications that hamper fertility as they age. It's also hard because, you know, with the female rhinos, if they don't, you know, naturally mate, uh, they don't need someone to, you know, um, and they reach uh, sexual maturity. Oftentimes they develop uh, reproductive challenges like myoma, it's called, uh, even cancer sometimes. So for that part, it's it's already very much uh, adding to, to the challenge um, in terms of like population and geography. Which makes this particular birth so rare. This birth is very much very, um, you know, uh, spectacular news because uh, one thing, it's, it's a new calf and it's uh, born in captivity. Uh, another thing is it's a female calf, uh, meaning that there's uh, another uh, potential for more births, right? If, if we want to be a bit more, you know, uh, technical in terms of like future with the population. This calf's father, Andatu, was actually the first Sumatran rhino born and bred in captivity in Asia since 1889. Andatu's father, Andalus, was also born in captivity at the Cincinnati Zoo in 2001 and was transferred to the Sumatran rhino sanctuary in Wakambas, where he was paired with Rosa, who gave birth to Andatu in 2012. So Andatu is actually the first uh, rhino that was born in captivity after I think 100, more than 120 years before the uh, previous, uh, the last one. So, um, and that is actually the, yeah, the, 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 the first rhino to be born in captivity. His parents were um, in uh, Cincinnati Zoo 
Andalas, his father was brought back to Indonesia and his mom or his mother, um, Ratu, if I'm not mistaken. And she was uh, one of the, um, you know, captive rhino in Indonesia already. So they that made it them and then produced uh, Andatu. And now he's the father of another <laughs> captive rhino. So that's a great kind of link, I guess. If you listen to previous conversations on the podcast with Jeremy Hansen, Wulan Pusperini, you'll recall questions surrounding the status of the species wild population have conservationists extremely worried and sitting on pins and needles as they attempt to make progress in captive breeding efforts. Given this tension and the remarkably grim prospects, I asked Baston if he felt this birth had given a renewed sense of hope that the species can be saved. Absolutely, but it's a uh, it's a realistic kind of uh, ho- big hopefulness. You know, uh, I think everyone knows how difficult it is for um, the, the species to naturally breed and reproduce. But this news is a breath of fresh air because you know it's been so long. Um, the last captive rhino that was born was a few, uh, I think, four years ago. I think it was in uh, 2016. And yeah, no understanding that there's a new one and, and this program, the captive breeding program is producing uh, more rhino cows. It's definitely uh, a positive news for you know, wildlife experts and observers around the world. And uh, hopefully it is you know, a, a new sign of more birds coming from, from, from the captive rhinos in Indonesia. So you might be wondering now, when can we get a viable population going? How long is that going to take? Well, it depends on a few factors, and we're still quite a ways away from it. So experts say that a viable population is at least 20 rhinos with uh, sex rate, uh, with equal, almost equal, or roughly equal sex ratio between the females and the uh, males. So right now, we, uh, in captivity in Sumatra, uh, in Waycombas, we only had with the newborn, it's only eight. So, <laughs> and and um, reproductive rate is between three years. The ideal reproductive rate for the rhinos is between three years. So, and the meanwhile, the last rhino born in captivity was four years ago. And yeah, I, I, I don't want to be speculative, I guess, but yeah, it's definitely going to take some, some more time, you know, and I think one of the strategies uh, planned by the Indonesian government is they're trying to add more uh, rhinos from the, wor- the wild into the uh, sanctuary to, you know, also help uh, advance or, you know, yeah, advance the productivity rate. The more, the merrier. Last year, Wulan Pusperini spoke with me about the search and rescue program, which is trying to pull out all the stops to get any rhino into captivity in the hopes of reducing the amount of time between birds and also just protecting rhinos in general. They, they started with monitoring, so they're trying to count first uh, how many rhinos left in the wild. And then they're trying to uh, figure out, uh, well, generally they want to add more. Uh, but some experts suggest that it's good to rescue female rhinos because, you know, that, that increases the uh, birth rate, right? You know, the possibility for more births. Um, but yet at the same time, some experts say that, you know, any rhino will do, you know, rescue anyone, a rhino will do because at the end of the day, it's trying to rescue them from challenges and, and, and threats from the wild, from, you know, poaching and, you know, uh, deforestation and stuff like that. Um, and even that natural deaths due to not being able to, you know, socialize with or meet with any other rhino, right? You get so lonely, I guess. And the sanctuary has expanded with plans to add rhinos, as well as plans for a new sanctuary and captive breeding program in Aceh. Uh, because it's recently been... Um, you know, uh, expanded the sanctuary, right? Uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, so they're trying to add three more uh, rhinos and um, they plan to bring in the ones from uh, Bukit Tarisan. Um, and also in Sumatra, it's quite near the current sanctuary. And then, um, but yeah, that's, that's still only the plan. Um, they're also adding a new sanctuary in Northern Sumatra, in Aceh to be sp- uh, specific. 
there's a quite viable population there and they're trying to do the same thing basically like captive breeding program in, in, in Aceh for the population there. With such a small captive breeding population, genetic diversity is definitely a concern. And so there's a plan to use a captive female in East Kalimantan to mate with a male in Wake Canvas in order to address this. I think the main plan is still to, you know, have more births uh, because that's the, the, the main goal, right? That's the, the focus of the, the sanctuary, adding more rhinos. There was a plan mentioned by the government to, you know, um, maybe mate, because there's also one found in Kalimantan, right? And in East Kalimantan, and they want to, to increase the genetic diversity of the rhinos because inbreeding is also one of the biggest challenges for uh, the Sumatran rhino species. And so they're trying to maybe, uh, you know, have the, the one rescued in East Kalimantan is a female and they're trying to maybe mate the, the, the male in Waikambas and the female in East Kalimantan. The COVID-19 pandemic hampered many captive breeding plans in 2020, such as searching for a male mate for the female captive rhino in Borneo, as well as the plans for the new sanctuary in the Loser ecosystem. Work on building that sanctuary finally started last year, and the breeding effort with the rhino in Kalimantan is also in the works. Last time I checked, they, they are doing it, but of course with the COVID challenges, right? Uh, some plans are being postponed, uh, but I think this year, hopefully things are starting to pick up, pick up again, with, uh, especially with COVID. Here in Indonesia, it's, tr- it's pretty much being well controlled for now. So yeah, hopefully more uh, plans are being executed by the government and hopefully more birds will, you know, we will hear more uh, rhin- uh, rhino birds. The stakes are high, and not just for the rhinos, but for the health and the future of Indonesia's rainforests. The Sumatran rhino is a key seed spreader, contributing to an estimated 79 different plant species. And also, by their movement, they trample certain vegetation, which in turn promotes or makes way for new pristine forest. This is why they are sometimes referred to as the construction workers of the rainforest. The reason why we have to save the Sumatran rhinos is because they are... Um, I remember the late uh, Widodo Ramono, he was the executive director of Indonesian Rhino Foundation. Um, he, he passed away a couple of years ago. Um, and he said that Sumatran rhinos are the construction workers of the pristine rainforest. So the idea of the captive breeding program is to produce enough population to bring them back into the wild, into the wild for, uh, rainforest, right? So having that species being, you know, uh, rescued and saved, it means that there's hope for more, you know, for better um, forests in Indonesia, hopefully. So that's, I think, uh, the reason why we, you know, a lot of people are working on saving this great uh, megafauna. Because Swatan rhinos, they, you know, they, uh, they help with seed dispersal. And also, uh, you know, they, they're herbivores, herbivores, right? So they're, they're, they prefer certain vegetation. And then when they eat, they, you know, poop and stuff like that. They, they also make way. Uh, so they like to, you know, tramp on a certain uh, vegetation. So it make way for new growth of uh, forest. Thanks to Bastin for contributing to this bonus episode. Before you go, make sure you are subscribed to Manga Bay Explorers wherever you get podcasts, as we have two exciting seasons forthcoming this year, with a special guest host producing an investigative series on environmental crime in the European Union, as well as a season hosted by myself on another very special island, Madagascar. Make sure to check our previous three seasons of Manga Bay Explorers, which unpacked threats to North American salamanders, the island of Sumatra, and most recently, the island of New Guinea. Manga Bay Explorers is an ongoing podcast series diving into environmental stories from around the globe. If you enjoy this show, we ask that you please tell a friend. That's the best way to help expand our reach and keep growing. Please subscribe to Manga Bay Explorers wherever you get podcasts, and don't forget to leave a review and let us know what you think. 
Special projects like this are made possible by our Patreon supporters, so please consider becoming a monthly sponsor via our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash mongabay. Even just a dollar per month will really help us offset the production costs and hosting fees. Keep up with all of Mongabay's news from Nature's Frontline at mongabay.com or get updates via Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and also TikTok, where our handle is at mongabay. Thank you once again, and we'll be back soon with another episode of Mongabay Explores.